All right, and welcome back, everybody. So last time we discussed the idea behind a singular value decomposition and showed that they exist. Every matrix has a singular value decomposition. So unlike diagonal, diagonalizability, uh, having this uh, singularization actually is more of a ubiquitous property, and we can actually use this, right? We can actually go ahead and start applying the SVD to a couple of different scenarios. And the most important one for us is, the most important few actually, I think, are these three applications. Uh, yes, there is one more in your textbook talking about the Penrose wee, pseudo inverse. And this one is important, but I will go out and say that we have technically already talked about it. We already know what this guy is, uh, especially in the context of uh, least squares problems. So in order to save some time here and uh, maybe a little bit of heartache and headache, we're not going to talk about it here, but once we get through these sections, you'll know how the singular value decomposition is used, how it works. And this is the pseudo inverse is something that you could figure out on your own on your own time. So we don't uh, need to kill time here with something that is basically a rehashing of stuff that we did in chapter five. So let's go ahead and skip the pseudo inverse here and go straight on to these uh, three bullet points here, these three items that are in many ways kind of the, the cornerstone of a lot of compression algorithms and a lot of uh, a lot of data reduction, like dimension reduction in data. So especially on this guy, this principal component analysis is something that is going to be uh, extraordinarily important for uh, statistical analysis of large data sets. And I will show you how to do that. It will show you what uh, principal component analysis looks like, but that won't be until the next video, possibly even two videos, depending on how, the, how this one goes. So let's go ahead and start. Let's figure out what, uh, what do I mean in this first section? Why does the two norm have anything to do with the singular value decomposition? Then we'll talk about the condition number as well. So the two norm, we have a theorem that relates the two norm of a matrix to the singular values of A, specifically to exactly one singular value, right? And what actually winds up happening here, uh, there is uh, another theorem that talks about, let me see if I, oh, let's bring up MATLAB real quick. Oh, get up here, don't be shy. My little guy, he's being shy. Oh, for crying out loud. No, you stupid thing. Okay, it's being a stupid thing. Oh, come on. For some reason, I don't want to dock. There we go. Okay, finally. So, coming back to this idea A here, let me see. But if I try to feed eigen, if I try to feed a non- uh, non-square matrix in here, it's gonna just go ahead and tell me, nope, you need to use a, you need to use a square matrix, you dummy. So if I ask it instead for the singular value decomposition, then I get the, then I wind up getting the uh, singular values, right? And if I wanted the full decomposition, remember, I can go ahead and ask it to store all the outputs into these matrices U, S, and V, and then A is going to equal U star s times v transpose and voila is this equal to a well numerically speaking yes format long if i ask you u star s times v transpose again okay it looks pretty darn close up to a numerical approximation so yes let's come back so if i ask for the two norm here the norm of a Hmm. Remember, this 2 norm is going to be the largest amount in the Euclidean 2 norm that this matrix A scales a unit vector. And it turns out that that is exactly what winds up happening here. If I were to ask what the singular values were, so S, turns out that the singular values 
are telling me exactly what that two norm is. And I can do this with another matrix. Let's go ahead and give myself a random, uh, maybe a B matrix, rand I, and we'll do this up to 10, and we'll make it, I don't know, maybe a four by seven matrix. So it makes it really non-symmetric. And I ask, okay, are there eigenvalues? No, you dummy, it's not square. However, singular values, on the other hand, SVD of B, hmm, 37.313, it's the dominant, the dominant singular value. Now let's ask, what's the two norm of B? 37.3132. Interesting. This is what I would like to show. I want to show that the two norm of a matrix is exactly equal to the dominant singular value of that matrix. Let's prove it. So. Let's go ahead and suppose that we've already ordered and named our singular values for A, and we're going to choose a basis uh, such that uh, QI is the ith principal vector, and the vectors QR plus 1 and up out to QN constitutes a basis for the kernel of A. Remember, these are corresponding to the zero eigenvalues of A transpose A, so we don't want them. They're not, they're not principal vectors. So... Let's go ahead and take a singular, de uh, singular value decomposition such that sigma is equal to the diagonal of the singular values in that particular order, and that P1 through PR are going to create this matrix P, and gamma, uh, being the columns of these guys, forms an orthonormal basis for the image of A. So that's just the setup that we get for free from the singular value decomposition theorem. We just need to make sure that these guys line up in the appropriate way. So if I have a unit vector u hat sitting in Rn, remember my two norm is asking how what's, what's the largest that this thing could scale by? What is the absolute largest value that or largest length that can be scaled out by multiplying by a? So I'm going to go ahead and let uh, u here, u hat, be expressed in this Q basis. So let's see. If U hat is indeed equal to this uh, linear combination of the of these uh, of these QI whoa of these QI vectors, then I know that the length of this guy, because it's a unit vector, I'm gonna go ahead and use my uh, my orthogonal decomposition theorem which creates a general Pythagorean theorem, to say that the coefficients have to add up in square norm to 1. And this is because I have an orthonormal basis beta. So these q's are the principal vectors, right? The principal vectors are an orthonormal basis for the co-image of A. So what happens when I go ahead and multiply A into u hat? Well, linear is the linear... Uh, yeah, the linear, so matrix multiplication is linear. So the A factors into the sum, it factors out the CIs. And because of the nature of these, uh, these singular values, remember, I had P is equal to A sigma Q transpose, or is that right? Let me go back a page, two pages. A Q sigma inverse is equal to P. Do, 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 do. A, Q, oh, I'm going to do that in red. A, Q, sigma inverse is equal to P. So that means that if I multiply A times Q here, this is just me multiplying my principal vectors or scaling my principal vectors by the singular values, right? Therefore, what I wind up with here, be very careful to note, that a times qi is equal to the zero vector once we pass the index r because qr plus 1 through qn are all part of a basis for the null space. Okay, so be very careful. That's how many vectors we have here. So that the two norm of a times u, uh, u hat is equal to a maximum, or at least, uh, sorry, the two norm of this, uh, of this, this vector is my Euclidean distance function. 
my Euclidean, Euclidean 2 norm. And notice that sigma 1 dominates every other sigma i. So that's where the inequality comes from. I'm saying that sigma 1 is the dominant, uh, dominant singular value here. And now I have sigma 1 squared that I can factor out of the sum and all the way outside of the square, uh, the square root. And I will wind up with sigma 1 uh, times, well, there's a whole bunch of other pieces that were omitted in the multiplication because I multiplied by null vectors, by, by kernel vectors. So that means that I can go ahead and add on these, uh, these extra CI components here, and at the cost of just being an upper bound. And that means that this piece is equal to 1 by this above, the fact that I'm using an orthonormal basis Q. All right. So that means that my 2 norm is bounded above by sigma 1. Great. Specifically, if I use Q1, then I can go ahead and say that sigma time, or A times Q1 is actually equal to sigma times, I believe it would be times a P vector, which would mean that this guy would give me exactly the correct scaling. And that means that my 2 norm is bounded below by sigma 1 as well. Therefore, my 2 norm is actually equal to the dominant singular value. How about that? And just as an example, just to kind of show you, uh, illustrate this, and let's see if uh, MATLAB will be nice to me this time. Nope. Yep, there it is. Haha. <laughs> so let's go ahead and make a equal to 1 by 2 by 3 by 4. And then we ask for the eigenvalues. Yay, we have eigenvalues, but one of them is negative. However, if I ask for the singular value decomposition, hey, these guys are actually a tiny bit different. Strange, very strange. But check this out. So if I go by A transpose A, it gives me 10 by 14 by 14 by 20 as per the notes. I go ahead and figure out my eigenvalues here of A transpose A are equal to about 29.87 and 0.13-ish, which is exactly what we see. So that my singular, my dominant singular value is the square root of that 29.87. Square root of answer 2. Sure enough, there's the 5.46-ish. Okay, and I just ask, what's the norm of A? 5.465. So indeed, these guys do give me the correct uh, 2 norm. Right? And that was actually a lot easier than what we did last time uh, when we actually had to compute this guy directly. I mean, you remember that? We had to go through basically, uh, basically some calc 1 uh, to, min to maximize a function on a circle, it was obnoxious. And don't even get me started about how you would do that on in higher dimensional space. But the point is that we can go ahead and compute these guys, uh, these two norms very quickly using the singular value decomposition, and specifically just by getting the singular values. We don't even need the rest of the decomposition. We just need to know what the singular values look like. In fact, just the first one is all we need. All right, so this brings us to condition number. It's another thing that really only depends on the singular values of this matrix. So recall, two matrices, if I'm, uh, if I'm thinking about matrices as belonging to a normed linear space, these two guys are close if the norm of their difference is small. So remember that we said that these matrices could be considered close to each other because their difference is, let's see, what is their difference? It's going to be, yeah, the difference. So a minus b is actually equal to minus 0 0.0001, 0, 0, and minus 0 0.0001. So it's a diagonal matrix. So we just go ahead and ask what is the dominant, or yeah, what is the, the, uh, what is the scale factor on a, on a diagonal matrix? 
and it's just going to be whatever the largest diagonal element is in absolute value. And that's exactly what we see here. So these guys are close to each other because their difference, the norm of their difference, is small. So consider, the rank of A, though, is 1, right? They have this uh, second, second column is twice the first. So there's a, there's a dependence relation between those vectors. But rank of B is actually full, right? So these guys are close to each other, but they have different ranks. So in particular, notice what happens here, that uh, we, we are able to get solutions to some of these guys, uh, to anything where, to anything where the, the solution vector on the right-hand side is actually in the image of the, of the matrix A or B. But the first one here, this gives no solutions Right, and we can see that. You can actually go ahead and check your Fred Holm alternative here if you'd like. There are no solutions to that to that system, but there is another one here. There is a solution to this guy, but it's actually really, really poorly conditioned. Like it's going to give us a terrible, terrible approximation to that solution. Right, if we change B so that it really looks like A plus. 10 to the minus 20th times the identity. So we make this horrendous uh, approximation of A even worse. So instead of being off by four decimal places from A, it's going to be off by 20. And this problem, uh-oh, sorry, one up just crashed. Okay, there we go, we're back. So that problem where this guy is, uh, is going to give you terrible round off error that round off error gets so much worse down here. So we run into a rather large numerical problem in this case. In the limit, right? So if I keep adding smaller and smaller offsets, then I then in theory, yeah, I will get to something that converges on the original matrix A. And all of the BNs are close to this singular matrix A. So that means that our round off errors are naturally going to get worse and worse and worse because we're taking solutions that have, we have, we take systems that have solutions and they have to converge on something that doesn't have a solution. So we would like to detect when this sort of thing happens. We saw this all the way back in chapter one. We were talking about practical uh, computing that this weird thing happens uh, in round off when you're dividing by really, really, really small numbers and you can't avoid it. So in able to, uh, for us to be able to detect this, we need to come up with a measure of that. And this is what we're going to go ahead and call the condition number. Now this is kappa of A, and it's the ratio of the largest singular value to the smallest singular value. Okay, in that order, right? Sigma 1 over sigma R. And as an example, this matrix A, come on, MATLAB. Oh, come on. We can do it. We can do this. There it goes. I'm getting the hang of this. Check out the matrix A here. A is equal to 4 by 1 by 1 by 4. And we say, okay, great. We have a relatively well-behaved matrix. How do I know this? Because I can ask for the singular value decomposition and say, okay, answer 1 divided by answer 2 here. This is going to be a ratio of about 1.667, so, or 6667, right? And that's relatively well behaved, right? Because this guy is on the order of a constant, right? There's only, uh, it, it looks, uh, yeah, it's, it's not just a constant. It has no orders of 10 associated with it apart from 10 to the 0. However, if I go to this matrix, B is equal to 1.12342, 2, and we go 1 and 2, 1, 2, 3, 4 decimal places. Come up with this matrix, and we say, okay, remember, norm of A minus B is supposed to be small, and it tells me that's not, and that's not okay. Weird stuff is happening, because I changed A. There it is. <laughs> okay, uh, so if C is equal to 1 by 2 by 1 by 2. 
Then we check uh, norm of C minus B. And sure, these guys are exactly as close as we thought they were up at the top of the page on the notes. But I ask, what are the singular values of B here? So B is going to be this matrix. And we see that the singular values of B are in the following ratio. Answer 1 divided by answer 2. That's on the order of 10 to the 4th. So this is not so great. So yes, this guy is non-singular, but he has a rather large condition number. And what does that mean? Well, if I'm trying to solve something here, let's uh, check out A. A, uh, let's see, eigenvalues of A, this guy, yep, this guy is non-singular because he doesn't have any zero eigenvalues. So I can go ahead and say a backslash whatever vector I want. And let's go ahead and say b is equal to a random, uh, let's make it a 2 by 1 vector. So a backslash b gives me a solution. I'm going to call that guy x. And I check a times x. Sure, that's equal to b. But let's see what happens now if I go to this near singular matrix, right? This guy eigenvalues of b are non-zero. So once again, it's non-singular. But what happens if I try to solve this against the b vector? Let's go ahead and say a times, so y is going to equal this answer. Those solutions are pretty big. a times y, or sorry, this is going to be b times y. We want this to be close to b. OK, it is. That's great. That's really, really helpful. OK. But what happens if I change b? So this is 1 by 2 by 1 by 2. But I'm going to add to it, like I said in the notes, what if I add a really terrible approximation format long so that we can see it? Maybe not. Ooh, that's outside the machine epsilon. Yep, and I can double check that. Machine epsilon is about 10 to the minus 16. So I need to change up my definition for b. There's minus 13th. Okay, so this is going to be pretty small, right? Very, very close to singular matrix. And I can double check A or B backslash little b. Okay, and that's supposed to equal Y. So what happens if I do B times little y? Okay, it's still okay. This is not bad. This is definitely not bad. But what if I get real close to machine epsilon? Yeah, it doesn't recognize it anymore as being non. Yeah, as not being the singular matrix. So check this out. What happens if I go and solve b backslash little b? Oh crap, y is equal to the answer here. And I say b star y. It's still okay. This is okay. But if I go one more step backslash little b. Apparently it has no solution. It's because these y values are getting unbounded, right? This matrix is singular or very close to it based on the machine epsilon. So the thing that we want to take away from this discussion is that these condition numbers I can actually get from MATLAB. They are, they are a, a command. So you can just ask, what is the condition number of a? It'll compute the uh, singular values and tell you exactly what they need, uh, what their ratios are from from dominant to uh, to least to least positive. And I can ask, what's the condition number on B here? <laughs> Holy crap, that is a really big condition number, and that's the thing that's going to tell us when we can expect these massive round off errors in our in our uh, systems. So the rule of thumb here is that uh, in a system with a condition number that's on the order of 10 to the k, we tend to lose about k digits of accuracy uh, in addition to whatever loss of precision we get in calculating our solution vector x. So large condition numbers are bad. Okay, And in pers uh, a little bit more perspective here, the condition numbers on the uh, Hilbert matrices that we had from way back toward the beginning of the semester these guys are actually exponential in order, so it's actually really, really terrible to work with Hilbert matrix. 
but it also means that if your algorithm works against a Hilbert matrix very well, then that is an exceptionally strong algorithm. But once again, the thing to take away here is that large condition numbers are, are very, very bad, and we'd like to avoid them if at all possible. So this video is already running long enough. Uh, the next thing that we're going to talk about is going to be this low rank approximation uh, idea. And this is what our final project is going to be based off of, this low rank approximation. And we're going to see how this relates to the singular value decomposition in the next video.